Uh, If you would, turn to the book of Hebrews. For those of you that don't know, my name is Lauren. I am one of the pastors, one of the elders here at TFAB. Uh, You always know what you get from us. Uh, We go through books of the Bible. We pick up where we left off from the previous week. So you can be studying ahead throughout the week. Been in the book of Hebrews for a month and a half, making rapid speed. (laughs) Hebrews chapter (laughs) 2. Well, we started out the book of Hebrews in chapter 1 by taking a hard look at really the divinity of Christ. Now, when I say divinity, do not be confused. I mean, it's almost Christmas time, but I'm not talking about that funky, gross, white, sugary, no substance thing filled with nuts, okay? Um, That stuff ranks right up there with like licorice, black licorice, and candy corns. If you like those things, I know where we stand as friends. Um, (laughs) There is nothing divine or heavenly about that, right? Our understanding of divinity is not food. Divinity speaks of God. So when we refer to the divinity of Jesus, what we're talking about is the absolute truth that God himself took on flesh in the person of Christ. That's literally what Christmas is all about. Maybe you've been sold the lie that Christmas is about a lot of other things. It's about family, food, friends, all those things which end up usually disappointing you at some point. Christmas is about the divinity of Christ. And in chapter one of the book of Hebrews, the writer basically takes out his AR writing and he just starts firing shots. I mean, really, really big, vast ideas about who Jesus is. He told us in one sentence that Jesus is the better prophet as the revelation of God. He is the better son, which makes him the heir, the inheritor of all things. It told us that Jesus is our better creator, that he is the radiance and the exact imprint of who God is. And he holds all things together by his word. He is the one that has purified us of our sins. He, the Bible tells us, is better than any angel because he is not created like them. He's the better king. He's the better priest. He is the better prophet who reigns forever. Now, that was just chapter one and why it took us a month and a half. As we entered into chapter two last week, we saw that there was a pretty big warning the first of five warnings that the author of the book of Hebrews tells us about, he says to us, you cannot see Jesus for who he is and what he has done and the offer that he gives you of salvation and simply drift on by that. You can't do it. Which means you can't reject the true version of Jesus because that is the only way that we can be made right right with God. Now, I say true version because if you've existed in society, which we have, there are lots of versions of what people have made Jesus out to be. I mean, we have kind of the Western cultural um, political Jesus, right? That gets really loud. Uh, We have how the Pharisees, the religious rulers of the day, viewed him as an imposter, and they actually said, no, he's, he's from Satan. Uh, we have Jesus, uh, the liberator of kind of physical oppression from like the Romans that gets talked about. We have the Simpsons, where you have Ned Flanders' version of Jesus. Or there's even South Park Jesus. There's the long-haired hippie Jesus, accessorized with like sandals, a dress, and a matching purse, Right? We have so many views of Jesus, it's like watching the Barbie movie, (laughs) and it's brutal, right? And they are improper views of Jesus. Now, you may believe 
in one of those Jesuses, usually they are made after our own image, but that Jesus doesn't exist, nor does the salvation that would come from him. The writer is warning us, if we do not see Jesus in his proper place, chapter one, and hear the gospel of grace that he extends to you, and we don't receive it, but we simply drift on by, we are going to miss out on this great salvation. Now, some of you might say, mm, what if I just keep drifting? After all, what's so great about this idea of salvation? You Christians, you say that Jesus is, is divine and awesome and great, good for him. He's God. He lives supposedly somewhere better than here. And we're stuck on this depleting rock called earth where it seems that life is simply filled with more pain than pleasure. Trial, toil, tears, which all abundantly trump any kind of cheer or joy that seems to be talked about during this time of the year. I mean, let's be honest, in the midst of all the pain and all the injustice that we look out and see and all the frustration that we experience under the sun, does God even care about us? Like if there is a deity, if he is divine, does he care? Does he even know what it's like to experience what we experience? How can divinity understand what it's like to be human? But wait, the writer now is going to tell us he cares. And he does know. And the answer to how much he cares and knows is found not only in the reason for the season right now, Jesus, but really the rest of this chapter, which describes what our great salvation actually entailed. You see, the writer expresses the immensity of what the second part of the Trinity, Jesus, did in taking on himself humanity, revealing to us three things here this morning that we're going we're gonna to camp on that Jesus is our better king, that Jesus is our better, it's gonna say founder, but the word there should be champion or hero, and he is our better brother. Let's listen to what the text has to tell us this morning as we jump into chapter two. It says in verse five, now, it was not to angels or messengers that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, and now he quotes Psalm 8, what is man? What is man? that You are mindful of him. You even think about him. Or the son of man, that you care for him. You made him, this is speaking of God, made him, speaking of us, a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. There's a big question, like with all the pain, all the toil, all the strife, all the stuff that we deal with, does God care? Now, by the preceding verses, you have to declare yes. The Bible says, First and foremost, there's a future plan, and that is God plans to create a new world. We call this the new heaven and the new earth. This is going to be a place where the sins of our own and the sins of others doesn't exist. It's going to be a place where there is no more sorrow. There is no more pain. There is no death without Satan, even the destroyer just causing havoc. This will be a world where peace reigns, where there's no need for a police force, where poverty ceases and politicians and the IRS are no more, praise God. <laughs> so does God care? He says, look what I'm doing for you kids. I am gonna create something new. 
something that your mind cannot even fathom of how good it is. And yet, we all know our soul longs for that. And that's why we ache when things happen that don't seem right. You see, he cares enough to see that this world is depleted and it's not place for kids for eternity. He's gonna create a new one. This world will become like from earth 1.0 and get a massive upgrade to like 100.0. It's like when you switch from an Android to an iPhone. You all should. So that way I know when you're actually texting me. It's just better. There's gonna be no more sadness, no more frustration, no more viruses. And who's gonna be in charge of this place? Now, the obvious answer is God is over all things, but who is he going to give dominion to? Who will this earth be in subjection to? The Bible says here, it's not to one of these other created beings like angels. So who? This is where the writer reaches back to the Old Testament Psalms once again, and he says there in verse six, it has been testified somewhere. Now, this is hilarious to me. I mean, if you, if you read the Bible a lot, there's just these moments where it's like, what in the world? He, he says, it, it, it's been testified somewhere. He must have been having a senior moment. That's, that's the only thing that I could think of right here because I know he knew where this was from. So there's something lost in translation here for us because he's about to quote Psalm 8 like perfectly. So he knew where it was from. Now, when David wrote this particular psalm that the writer is referring back to, listen to what it actually says. David was there in, in, in Psalms chapter eight. The Bible tells us this. I, I wanna read it to you because you need to feel the weight of what the psalmist has said to what the writer of Hebrews is now grabbing and using as an illustration. Psalm eight. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants. You've established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man? This is what Hebrews is quoting. What is man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I don't know when David wrote this. Perhaps it was on a night where he sat under the stars after the victory over Goliath. Perhaps it was after the birth, maybe of one of his kids. Or perhaps it was after his great failure with Bathsheba, where he murdered a man and slept with someone that was not his wife. Whatever the moment was, on this particular night, David somewhere looked up, he sees the stars, and he said, when I see all this, why do you even think about me? Like, when you consider how small we are in the universe, and we're not just looking at our phones all the time, when you put it down, and you get away from all the noise, and you look up in God's amazing creation. First of all, it brings wonder, but it also brings awe. Why do you even think about me? I mean, I don't know if you felt that. The universe is so big. There's been so many people throughout history. Why do you think about us? I mean, Calculations show there are more than a hundred billion galaxies, galaxies observable in the observable universe. 
Each galaxy contains 200 billion stars. The total stars equal out to be about 40 billion trillion. Like, your mind cannot even comprehend how big that is. That's without the estimated 10 billion trillion stars in the unobserved dwarf galaxies. Wondering what a dwarf galaxy is? It's where Gimli lives, from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that means there are about 50 billion trillion stars, give or take 10 billion, in the observable universe. How big is that? How big is that? Let's talk dimes. If that same number of dimes were packed together as densely as possible and piled 1,500 feet high like a skyscraper, that amount of stars in dimes would cover the entire North American continent. That's a lot of stars. That's dropping dimes. <laughs> Psalm 147 tells us this. 147 verse 4 and 5. He, check this out. It's crazy. He, God, determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. So for Christmas, if you go try to name a star, God's already done it. You're plagiarizing. Somebody made a lot of money off that thing because there's a lot of stars. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Let's talk spacing. How much space is between these billions and trillions of stars? If you were to shrink the average star, right, down to the size of a grapefruit, given the average distance between stars in the Milky Way is 40 trillion miles, if you were to put that grapefruit in the U.S., do you know how close the next, next one would be? It would be like L.A. to Siberia. The universe is vast. Multiply that by 40 million times. And the universe is even bigger than that. And here's what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12, it says, God, his hand spans the universe. God is huge. Huge. Yet here's what blows my mind. And David, in the Psalms, he thinks about us. We must be the equivalent of like an electron molecule in his hand. And the Bible says, he's mindful of us. Like the psalmist, we say, what are we that God is mindful of us? Even at that, not just one of us, right now in the world today, there are 7.8 billion people and two more are coming every second. Josh and Elizabeth just helped us out with that this morning. Yeah, that's cute. <clears throat> Ever think about our place in history? In history, that's 7.8 billion people today, but billions and billions and billions of people before us. I mean, my goodness, we're really not that significant, are we? The Bible says man is like, grass. It, 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 it grows and we just kind of fade away. How important are we? Grab a cup of water, put your finger in it, and see how long it takes to fill it when you pull it out. That's how important we are. The Bible says our life, it's just a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. Honestly, the truth is probably in this room and for most of us, 
We're not that significant. Nobody's building any statues about us in the future, right? We're not that important, but we are to God. The Bible says he remembers us. You're actually on his mind. Hebrews and the psalmist, they both say, he cares about you. God doesn't just remember man, he cares about man. The Bible says he knows our frame and he gets our frailty. The Bible says he takes interest. He says the very number of hairs on your head are numbered. For some of us, that's easier than others. The Bible says he has compassion. Psalm 56, eight says he takes our tears and he saves them in a bottle. In other words, he cares about what you cry about. That worked. I am so small, so significant, but God cares about me. So much so that he was willing to add flesh, humanity, to his divinity, to be like us in order to save us. Perhaps you feel like David. Perhaps you look around and you see this world so enormous, so big, so great, <sighs> so hurt. Perhaps you think, how can I have any worth or significance to a God whose hand spans the universe? You think, does God care? Does he see? Does he know? And the truth is, is yes, he does. He remembers little insignificant me. Not because I'm great, but because he is. Not because you are the all-star in the church softball team, <laughs> but because he is the ultimate all-star. Honestly, I look at humanity and what sin has done to us, and the only answer can be found in exploring his immeasurable grace, mercy, and love that he gives to us. And you need to hear and know today, first and foremost, God cares about he remembers you. He cares about what's going on in your life. He's drawing you to him. Well, you say, I'm going through some really difficult stuff. I'm struggling. Why does he just bail me out? Well, he's not a genie, right? And here's the truth. God uses all the junk in our lives to make us realize there's something better and there's outside of what is here. And it is him. Does God care? Yes. The psalmist told us he's creating a new world for us. Oh, I look forward to that. Does God care? Yes. He became a part of humanity to come down. Does God care? Yes. He will even place humanity. He says, we're going to actually rule with God. Does God care? Yes. He remembers and cares about us. And he tells us here in verse seven, he says, you made him, speaking of man, humankind, for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You've put everything in subjection under his feet. So look, God made the world for humanity. Originally, all creation was supposed to be under our control. It was made for us. It says, for a little while, we were made lower than the angels. Now, a little while means it's just temporary. It feels like a long while on our clocks, but it's just temporary. Say a king has a son, and for a while, he's got the tutors that are there. You would say, who is higher at that moment? For a little while, the tutor is. But the destiny of that son ultimately is to be in control of the whole country. Same thing. And that's amazing. We are to have higher privilege and position and glory than angels. That's crazy. You know why? Whenever an angel shows up in the Bible, they are so glorious, so beautiful, and so terrifying that the first words out of their mouth is usually, don't fear. Why? Because they're scary. They don't show up if you've got this view of angels looking like Cupid. They're not chubby, naked, with a diaper and a small bow and arrow, okay? I mean, that's scary. If anybody shows up on your doorstep like that, I would be scared of that and I would fear. Um, but that's not what they are. Literally, they show up and they have to say to you and me, they're so awesome, 
they have to show up to people and say, don't die. <laughs> Chill out. Be okay. It's going to be all right. Now, look around your circle. Look around the room. If the people around you know Jesus, they are destined to be in a higher position than that. Even your rebellious four-year-old son. The answer to who gets dominion over the earth is man. God is going to give control and dominion and subjection back to man. And as we will see, one man first and foremost in particular. Does God care? Yeah. He put everything in subjection. Here the author, he's got Genesis 1, 26 through 28 in mind, but here's the problem. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, were to have dominion. They were created to rule over all things. Man was given this awesome responsibility to govern creation, which Here's the crazy thing. We get some glimpses of this in Jesus, right? Jesus is in a storm. What does he do? Stop. What does it do? Stops. Jesus had the ability to walk on water. How cool is that? We see it in Adam's relationship with the animals, perhaps even in Eve's. What would have been weird to us, non-weird conversation with a serpent. Now, why don't we see this right now? Why doesn't it work for us like that? Uh, Verse 8 goes on, it says, Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. Uh Uh-oh, here's the problem. But at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That is the understatement of the year. I mean, if aliens showed up to Bend, Oregon, they would think dogs are running this place. They get the nicer parks, right? They're leading us around. They get food whenever they want it. I mean, this, it's, it's weird. This is the writer being honest about where we are in the story. He said, God thinks about man. God made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory. And he made man to rule over creation. (sighs) But how's that going for us? Ever feel like things are not going as planned? Like not all your stuff is in subjection to you? Wonder why your own kid won't listen to your advice? Ever feel like you work and you work and you work? You should be able to exist But just with current economics, it just makes it hard to even, like, survive? Ever have plumbing issues, both in your home and in your body? (laughs) Dang, the other night, I was on the floor. I'm laying on the floor for probably an hour with some type of abdominal issue, stone. I don't know what the heck it was, but I was down there for an hour, and I was hating my body. You are not in subjection to me. Ever get a message from a friend that one of the kids used to teach? Tended TFAB a few times, was murdered. I mean, what the heck? This world is not in subjection to us. The author of Hebrews, if everything is in subjection to us, what is going on? It ain't working. It's something broke. Why is it broke? Well, we know why it's broke. Just go back to Genesis. Adam and Eve rejected God's word. They partook of the fruit and they lost. Thanks, mom and dad. It's like they forgot to read the fine print from the pharmaceutical commercial. You guys know those, right? All they heard was take this. It'll be great. You can be like God knowing good and evil. They didn't read. May cause headache, vomiting, backache heartache, cancer, and a small percentage of people that like to drink water, there may be severe bleeding and inexplainable pain from every orifice in your body. (laughs) Forgot about that part, right? And they were. Fine print said, you'll die. Mankind was separated from God. Death became a reality. 
Humans have lost sight of our purpose, which is to love God and worship him forever. It produced in humans a state of depravity, pain and childbearing and child raising. Earth and the animals are no longer in subjection to them. The ground was cursed so that man would work and sweat from his brow. And you would not know if you were actually going to receive any fruit from your work. And you feel like that? Sin multiplied. So someone asked, why is there war? Why is there rape? If there's this good God, why is there disease? Why does it seem that every day breeds one more thing to just suck the freaking life out of us? Man's fall allowed Satan to have rule, the prince of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He has some control. And I say some because he's not greater than God. But even in this state, even in this state, does God care about us? Has he forgotten us? Has he abandoned us? No, for there's hope. Right now, everything is not in subjection to us. Most of us, I mean, you guys know this. It's not in subjection to us. Most of us are doing good if we can kind of train the dog to roll over and the stupid demonic feline to use the litter box. Here we have a shot of hope for the future, for in the present, nothing works the way it should, but in the future, we will be back in the place God intended for us now. Here's the big how, because Jesus is better. Look, look at what it says. It's gonna tell us that our great king, our great, great ruler, he got involved in a way that's so beyond our, our, our minds. It is mind boggling. The hand that spans the universe would become man. Here's what it says, verse nine. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You have a king that didn't just see us in our pain, know about our pain, empathize with us in our pain, but he literally became pain. He took on death. He took on humanity. In 1964, the New York Times reported a murder of, of Kitty Genovese in Manhattan. Perhaps you remember it. A mugger came up to her, stabbed her. She screamed. Light came on. A whole bunch of people looked out their windows. The mugger, the rapist, backed away, but nobody came to her help. Nobody wanted to put themselves in harm's way. It was documented that 37 people saw this. Nobody got involved. When the assailant saw that no one was coming to help her, he came back where she had dragged herself into the alley raped and killed her, took her money from her purse. Nobody wanted to get involved. Nobody wanted to put them at risk. Jesus, our king, got involved. And he didn't just do it at the risk of, uh, uh, of his life. He did it at the actual cost of his life. The Bible tells us he tasted death for all of us. So just as we thank our first parents, Adam and Eve, man, you guys really messed that up for us. Oh, we really thank our better brother and champion, Jesus Christ, because he tasted death for all of us so that you and I might have life. We deserve punishment because we mess up. We know it. He took it and he exchanges his life for ours. Why? We have a God, a king that got involved. Then it tells us this. Not only is he the king that gets involved, verse 10 says, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by all things exist, the most important, in bringing many sons to glory, 
should make the founder or champion of their salvation perfect through suffering. Verse 10 says, he is A, the founder of our salvation, but he's also the champion. In other words, Jesus is the hero because Jesus is better. Uh, You jump down to verse 14 and 15. It says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise, Jesus, partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The writer picks up with this old school image where in military acts, in the past, there were times when instead of having all the armies fight each other, you would just bring out the champion. And the champion would fight for your tribe or your clan, and whatever your champion did, they won, great, victory, you rule. You lost, you became a slave. That's what the author here is talking about. This happened in Israel's history, didn't it? With David and Goliath, the guy that wrote this psalm earlier. David, a shepherd boy, fought and killed a Goliath, saving Israel from slavery. David was their champion. This is a picture of Jesus who won the battle against the real giant, Goliath. Well, we all stood on the sidelines and didn't do anything. And in so doing, he delivered us from the one thing that terrifies us most, and that's death. Our champion took our greatest fear and put it away. If he does nothing else for us, that's enough. Some people, when they come to know Jesus or, or come to know Christianity, they think, if I, if I get Jesus, then, then maybe I'm going to get some other things happening well in my life. And they use Jesus to get those things rather than understanding that if all Jesus ever did for me was die and provide the way of salvation for me, that's enough. That's enough. And that's okay. And the fact that he knows and has experienced what this life is like, he knows the suffering, he knows the pain, he relates to you in that, that's enough. And it wasn't easy for him. In the garden, we see his humanity. He's he's thinking about the cross that he's about to partake in. And he's literally, the Bible tells us he's sweating these great drops of blood because he's so intently praying and experience at the anxiety and the depression and the hurt that's there. He's praying. He actually says this in the garden right before he goes to the cross. If there's any other way, take this cup for me. Ever prayed to God and not had it answered? Jesus knows. But just as one man sinned, Adam, and we all experience that, so too one man conquered death and offers us life because he's our better champion. He's our better champion. And now death's power has been defeated and he takes the fear out of it. When I hear this week of my friend that knew Jesus, that was murdered, there is grief. He's heavy. But you know what? There's also hope in Christ because I know where she is. And I will see her not as she was, That is absolutely who God intended her to be. Death has been defeated by our champion because he suffered. Does your God know? Does he care? Does he understand? He does. He suffered that you might be perfect. And finally, here this morning, this makes him our better brother. Listen to the text. For he who sanctifies, that just means he sets you apart, and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not, listen to me, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am and the children God has given to me. Any of you have a brother? If you do, 
most of them are not your better brother, right? They flicked you. They picked on you. They gave you a cup of love or a Dutch oven. They spit loogies on your face. They made you do the impossible sit-up. They embarrassed you in front of girls. Brothers, they're brothers for the most part but Jesus is our better brother. Here's the thing. We're the worst brother. We were the brother that was like the black sheep in the family. We were not faithful. We didn't care about him. But do you know what Jesus says here? This is amazing to me. Jesus should have shamed us, but he doesn't. He proudly identified with you and he claimed you and he said, you're family. You're family. You're the better brother. I love looking sometimes, especially this time of year, through Jesus's genealogy. It was common in those days for kings to publish their genealogies. And one of the things they would do is try to show all the powerful people in their ancestry. And you'd be like, man, comes through a powerful line. No wonder that's why they are who they are. If there was somebody embarrassing in your ancestry, you would leave them out. Crazy uncle, creepy aunt, I don't know, whoever. But then you go read Jesus's genealogy this time of year. You know who's highlighted? Tamar. It's like one of the first ones off the bat. She's in Jesus's genealogy. You know what she did? She played the role of a prostitute to trick Judah, her father-in-law, to sleep with her so that she could have a kid because his three boys couldn't do it, and they died. You jump to Rahab, the Gentile, not a Jew, but she also was a prostitute. You have a girl in this genealogy who was raped by her uncle, David's illegitimate son was born, Solomon, out of murder and adultery. The people who failed and embarrassed themselves, these were the people Jesus, and he could have not included them, not even written them down, had them written down. He could have just moved them out of the story, come through a much cleaner line. But you know what? He's not ashamed of them. They're his brothers and sisters. In fact, one of the best resurrection scenes, John 20, 17, Jesus is coming to Mary in the garden. And and, and what does he tell her? He says this, go and tell my brothers that I am raised from the dead. They had bailed on him. All his friends had left him. And he's not ashamed to own them as brothers. He's not ashamed of you. He cares about you. Jesus is our better king that came down. He's our better champion that defeated death. He's your better brother who's not ashamed of you, which is why we worship him. Let's pray. God, you're just, you're too good to us. We thank you for being kind. We thank you for putting on flesh. We thank you that we get to celebrate you. And so now we come to your table, partaking of the body, the blood of Christ, remembering the grace that you offer to us. Be glorified in how we respond and worship you. You deserve it. Everything is yours. In your name. Amen. This time, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know Jesus, love Jesus, we just want to invite you to come to the table and we take of this, this cup, this, this red juice and this cracker, which Jesus, on the night that he would be taken and tried and then killed, said, this is my body. Partake of me. Remember me. And that's what we do. 
drink of my blood, remember me. So we come to the table to remember the work that Christ has done for us, that he was broken for us, that he suffered for us, and that he tells us, you're forgiven because you believe me. So we do that now. So we want to invite you to come. If you desire to give, there's boxes at the table. Let's just respond to him in these last couple songs as we worship him and honor him.